Uh, I'm Ian. Uh, we also have uh, Garrett, um, another one of my colleagues in the software engineering department. And then over there we have uh, Brett. Yeah, and we have Brett Haynes here, who is also another engineer on the team. He works primarily with the Raspberry Pi port and works on some of our other emerging devices. OK, so let's get started. All right. OK, so we're going to start with the topic of an introduction to the Internet of Things. Um, so how many people here are familiar with the term Internet of Things? How many people feel like you actually understand what they mean by Internet of Things? <laughs> OK, all right, that's, that's all right, that's all right. I'm going to go out and say it. This is an extremely hand-wavy topic in the tech industry. It's nebulous, and it's pretty, Ill it's pretty poorly defined. But for our purposes, what we kind of are thinking about with Internet of Things is consumer sensor networks, basically you know, little devices that are delivering data to some sort of hub, you know, and data analytics with that hub. And it's also sort of a you know, mainstream Linux devices largely fall under the Internet of Things uh, banner. So the Raspberry Pi, the Arduino, Intel Edison, you know, any device that basically puts embedded like computing into the hands of, uh, you know, regular users, you know, who are not, you know, doing system integration or having like a million devices produced in, you know, Shenzhen or something like that. That is, that is, that is under the Internet of Things umbrella. And um, if, if you can hold it in your hand and it can connect to some sort of network, it's pro you can probably call it Internet of Things. Right. Um, so that's basically you know what it what it refers to things like you know motors machines sensors you know weather stations and you know things connecting to the internet and delivering data. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and kind of like a, another thing about the Internet of Things that I think uh, a lot of people kind of forget about is that it's not just all of these different devices bringing data into the system. There's also the application of when you get that data, you analyze it, you figure out what's going on, and then you like put stuff out. So a typical example would be like, you know, but the example that I've heard a lot is the case of like having sensors in the road that can detect how much traffic is in the city and stuff. And so if you have a large metropolitan area and say there's some giant pile up on, you know, I-74 or something and you know, traffic is just terrible in that part of the city. The sensors could report to some central, you know, station that, hey, this part of the city is experiencing lots of traffic. And then based on that, you know, you could reroute bus routes or something and kind of do something with that. So it's not just about getting all this data and analyzing it. There's also like the output um, of it. So you get all the data as input, you analyze it, and then there's output as well. Right. So there's, you know, there's different directions Internet of Things goes in. There's the reading aggregating the data, then there's the doing. Yep. You know, and um, a lot of our demos, we have some demos here that are focused on reading data, putting data into the kernel and recording that data. And we've got some demos focused on just doing things, using the kernel, using Mathematica, the Wolfram engine, to actually do things on Internet of Things devices. Um, and um, those tasks are somewhat distinct from each other. Yeah, yeah. And, and one of the really powerful things that the Wol uh, Wolfram engine and the kernel and Mathematica bring to the uh, situation is the powerful data analysis that's made really, really simple. So one of the other kind of caveats that's kind of preventing the Internet of Things from like really taking off is that it's really difficult for people to get all this data together and then meaningfully analyze it, right? Because there's a lot of, you know, a lot of people with, you know, high paying jobs who are like data scientists and they know all about all these kinds of statistical methods and all, you know, this complicated stuff that they can do. But there's a lot of um, consumer people who would like to get into this, but they don't necessarily have that background. And so Mathematica and the Wolfram language bring to the equation the ability to like really rapidly start to analyze this data and understand um, data sets in, inside Mathematica. Right. And the thing to think about is the Internet of Things produces a lot of noise. It produces a lot of noise, and it produces a lot of very complicated data in large volume. Because when you're actually looking at what's coming out of a sensor, what's coming out of you know, some sort of smart device, what you're really talking about is a, is a stream of numbers. A stream of numbers that looked at without context are just going to be you know, you know, random data feed. And um, you know, one of the things I think that we bring to the table, and one of the things that we want to focus on, is turning data into you know, time device, you know, time series and yeah. quantities. You know, things that are actually physical quantities that can be read and understood by the, our software as quantities. Yeah. One uh, another like uh, 
So we have ma desktop Mathematica that you can use to analyze this stuff, but there's also Wolfram Alpha and the interpretation and like the interpreter engine that powers Wolfram Alpha. Um, all of that works. And so if you have something like, um, you know, say you have, I don't know, some sort of sensor that's reporting back, I don't know what's the unit, uh, dollars or something, you can use interpreter functions. And so you can say interpreter of currency amount, and then it's just applied to like, I don't know, $2. Um, and then, uh, and so it makes it really easy. So the result that we get back here is an actual like unit. And so interpreter is able to uh, kind of rapidly apply semantic analysis um, to really figure out what's you know hiding behind the data. Right, and just to take chores out of dealing with data, just dealing yeah. with data and quantities. Because I mean, I think there was an instance, what, like a few years ago, where I think NASA actually crashed a probe on yeah. account of a conversion error between metric and traditional conversions. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ex exactly. But you know, um, creating those additional those additional chores, those additional steps, and things people just need to think about and account for, you know, just adds complexity to the task of dealing with data and dealing with quantities. So one of the you know upshots to our high level quantity objects is that you can interact with them in any format you choose to. Yeah, yeah. And so and so these units aren't just like a little tooltip thing. You can actually so we could say uh, if I, let me scroll down here. No, that's okay, but we you can use functions like unit convert of well I can just take this unit right here and I don't know what's a What's a non-US currency, someone? Euros. Euros, all right, cool. Euro cent, yeah, there we go, euros. Um, and so that, and, and so you can just like rapidly apply all these different things and you don't have to worry about, oh, am I using the most up-to-date uh, trading things because it's all powered by Wolfram Alpha and all of, like just gobs and gobs of people are it's their job to bring data right. into Wolfram Alpha. And but we care more about the fixed units in this case because yes. As much as Intel might not like it and Qualcomm might not like it, the devices do not print money. So <laughs> yes, yes. The, so there's the currency, other... con the currency conversion yes. is perhaps not the most relevant uh, yes, uh, but... thing here. But so let's uh, move on to the. All right. So, Internet of Things, and I would. I'm just going to encourage you guys up front. If you guys have any questions about anything, just let us know. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're gonna. As we go, we're not separating this into a Q&A section. If there's anything that we're being unclear about or anything you'd like clarification on, just raise your hand and we'll go into it. Go ahead. All right. Uh, so one of the uh, really powerful things that uh, Wolfram has relating to Internet of Things is a thing called Data Drop. How many people are familiar with or have used Data Drop at all? Okay, so a few people. Um, what what really makes Data Drop powerful? How I describe it is like Dropbox is for your files. Data Drop is for your data. And so Data Drop, when you put data into it, it logs like when that data was put in, like what kind of data, and you can look at all sorts of time series. Um, it, it it logs lots of metadata about the data and makes analysis of that data very uh, simple and intuitive. Um, and so it's very easy to create. Uh, so in DataDrop, you have like the storage things are called data bins. And so you can just use functions like create data bin. Right. And while, while Ian goes ahead and fills in his credentials there, I'll talk a little bit about the importance of metadata for data collection. And one of the most important things you can get with data collection is a timestamp, because a lot of data that you capture is going to be, in some ways, it takes place in the physical world. And whereas, you know, we work in the symbolic world here where, you know, we try to avoid side effects wherever possible, the world of sensors and the world of physical devices is all side effects. And there is a, you know, there, there, there is oftentimes you will want to do some analysis of your data after you've collected it. And you might say have a have a sensor outside that's recording, you know, some sort of value like humidity or something like that, and then you might realize that your measurement is is inaccurate uh, when it's taken at a certain temperature. So you might look at the temperature data, or you might look at you know data on the weather after the fact, and then use that those that metadata to you know do some additional filtering of your data afterwards, and you know adjust the collection that you've done based on the time. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so data drop makes it really easy to create a location for these, and then uh, we can easily add to it. There are multiple different ways, um, data bin add. Uh, so I just take this data bin and, uh, whoops. Almost got away there. Yeah, tried to get away from me. Um, so you can add to the data bin, and here, I don't know, let's just add, uh, I don't know, two volts or something. 
Um, and now that will get added to the data bin, and now you see that the entry count is one. Um, obviously, it's really easy to add data uh, right from Mathematica, but one of the powerful things about DataDrop is that we also have like a full REST API. You can add it through the web form. Uh, there's lots of different ways uh, to add this from things outside the Wolfram language. So in lots of, lots of times you'll have devices like the Raspberry Pi or an Arduino Yoon or something that isn't running Mathematica or it doesn't make sense for Mathematica to be running there. Um, and it's still easy to add data to the, to the data bin from that by just making simple um, HTTP REST you know, calls and stuff. And so it's, it's really easy to bring data into DataDrop. Um, it's, you know. Right, and in a lot of cases, it just doesn't make sense to run the current to run the actual kernel to do something. If you're just you have a simple device that you know runs using like you know a tiny amount of power, yeah. you know sitting up on a tree somewhere taking data, taking collection, you don't want to incur the penalty of you know running you know workstation class software just in order to make that recording and record it somewhere. You want that workstation class software in the you know to be doing analytics, and we like our capability of doing you know analytics on you know, uh, devices that are more of full computers, like the Raspberry Pi, but you don't necessarily need them to collect data and work with it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so DataDrop makes it really easy to bring data into, um, into like a centralized location. You can analyze it, and then using the Wolfram language and uh, Mathematica, or Wolfram Desktop, or the Wolfram Cloud, uh, because right, you can access all this stuff from any of our products like that. Uh, makes it really easy to do, perform statistical analysis and analyze all that data uh, like we were talking about. That's kind of key to Internet of Things is filtering out the noise. And so it's really easy to do that kind of thing in Mathematica. But that's kind of the topic of another talk, all that data analysis. So okay, next one? Yep. All right. Um, so uh, Arduino is like kind of one of the, our, our first like big devices that we want to kind of push as an Internet of Things device because what, what the Arduino brings to the equation, well, first, an Ar what an Arduino is, for those who are unaware, is it's a small electronics um, platform. Um, I have one here. There's one over there. Um, it's a, what makes the Arduino specifically really powerful, because there are lots of similar devices to Arduino, is the open source community behind Arduino um, and all of the effort or the time and effort that people have put into uh, developing physical hardware to interface with it, but also the software that powers that. And so, uh, so, so there's the hardware aspect. So there's lots of devices like, you know, sensor shields for reading stuff like temperature, humidity. Uh, there's also really obscure shields like, I don't know, measuring CO2 or measuring some sort of gas or chemistry stuff. There's all kinds of uh, physical sensors you can use that have been like, you know, physically handmade for the Arduino. I have an example of one over here. Uh, this is a Vernier. Um, if people are familiar with the company Vernier, they make sensors for like uh, high school or college level uh, classes. And so this is a little shield that Vernier makes that plugs right into the Arduino that you can then take a, you know, a device like I have here, a force sensor, and plug it into the shield and then you can use it uh, with an Arduino. So there are lots of, there's lots of devices like that that people or companies have developed to make it easy to um, connect all sorts of physical devices with, with the Arduino. So that's kind of the, the hardware aspect. And then on the software side, uh, there's also like tons and tons of libraries and C and C++ that people have developed for interfacing with these devices um, that make it, you know, that make it so that you don't have to be an electrical engineer or a computer scientist to have, you know, to interface with these devices. You don't have to write thousands of lines of code. You can just, you know, use one library. It makes it simple. Right. And, and an important thing to talk about with, when we, when we bring up the Arduino, it may seem a little bit counterintuitive that we have these very different strategies for Arduino and then devices like a Raspberry Pis and BeagleBones and other sort of Linux boards that you see, you know, things that can actually run Mathematica. And you might wonder, what, what's the distinction here? And um, it has a lot to do with time. And the explanation is basically um, the Raspberry Pi is about as powerful as a desktop workstation from the mid-90s you know, to the late 90s, depending on the model that you have. And a Arduino really has the comp computational power of like a I don't know, a Nintendo like, like, or a Commodore 64. Or, or like a wristwatch, kind of. Like, yeah. It has like one purpose and one simple thing that you can upload and tell it to do, and it just does that. Like right. it 
But right. but what's useful about it is that whereas like you have a full fledged operating system and you can do all sorts of stuff like run Mathematica or uh, web browsers and stuff on a Raspberry Pi, that also brings with a lot of overhead in that it's you know. There's stuff that you don't need. So if I'm just reading from a simple temperature sensor or something, I can just plug it right into the Arduino, and I don't have to worry about any of the other stuff. I don't have to worry about like multi-threading stuff or like, you know, uh, Linux deciding that it wants to prioritize LibreOffice or something instead of my sensor application. You know, whatever. Uh, there's just the program I upload to the Arduino, and that's just what runs. Right. So time is absolute on a microcontroller. You know, you have a fixed problem that you're solving. You know, it is running a certain set of instructions and that it's all it is doing. So in a system where time is critical, you're gonna, end, you're gonna find yourself wanting to use an Arduino. Arduinos are also useful versus the Raspberry Pi specifically in that they have analog pins. Yep. And you need analog pins if you're going to be interacting with things like motors, right? Yeah. I mean, anything where, you know, you're sending a certain amount of, like, voltage or you're trying to drive a motor or drive wheels or something like that. You attempt to do that sort of stuff with a Raspberry Pi and you're really quickly going to find yourself with a burned out Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Because it's, uh, the margin of error is slim. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so, and so how Mathematica kind of comes into this, um, is there's a device driver in Mathematica, since Mathematica 10.1, that allows you to, to not only just read and write to these pins on the Arduino, so you take the Arduino and like physically plug in the USB cable and then you know, plug it into your computer and then you can start reading from it, um, reading from the pins and writing to the pins. But there's also the more complicated uh, and I think uh, cooler application of it is you can deploy uh, arbitrary functions to the Arduino and execute them. So this is a situation where you have some complicated sensor that has a library that somebody wrote for it, you know, like on the open, on, you know, the Arduino forums or somebody, you're like, hey, here's this library. Um, they wrote that library, and so using that library, it's really easy to interface with that device. So what you can do in Mathematica is you can deploy that library and deploy a simple function that just uses that library to the Arduino, and then you can call that code from within Mathematica, and then it will return back to you whatever the result is. So instead of having to write all of your code from scratch in like, you know, symbolic C or something, you just write a short little snippet of code in C or C++, and then deploy that to the Arduino, and you can call that um, and bring that data right in into Mathematica. So, all right. Now the Raspberry Pi. Now, the Raspberry Pi is the cheapest, the cheapest way to get your hands on the Wolfram language. It is the, yes. it is the lowest end device that we target for, for, uh, you know, for Mathematica. And um, it also is a little bit different. But, you know, it's, so it's a very low end device, but what makes it distinct from a PC is it has these very raw interfaces. It has things like GPIO pins on it. It has the ability to directly interact with hardware, with lights and things like that. You probably can do that with a PC, but you need a special card or board, or it might just be a bad idea, honestly. But yeah. um, you know, people like to, uh, so. So the Raspberry Pi is also useful if you know you need to do some sort of you need some sort of intelligence in your application. I think a, it's not uncommon actually to keep a to, for a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino to be used together. You know, the Arduino might drive some sort of physical system like motors or, you know, handle some sort of reading, and the Raspberry Pi may simply be running a simple program. Yeah. Read this data, make a simple decision. I'm going to continuously read this value, and when it reaches a certain temperature, maybe I'll send a message. I can send an yeah. email. I can send a tweet. You mean for, to buy, the, are you talking about, like, the availability of sensors to interface? Um, probably the Arduino, just because the Arduino, as Alex was kind of saying, has more of like a raw interface uh, in that you can have analog values um, inputting. And so it's much more likely that you'll find um, just kind of fringe sensors are made in, and you might have heard me mention the word shield. What a shield specifically means is like somebody made a, a board that physically plugs into, into the Arduino. Um, so like it just physically plugs into that and you don't have to worry about wiring or anything else. Um, right. I would say that um, another thing to consider, too, is whether you see your solution being largely tethered to your PC or whether you want that to be something that's deployed independently and has this independent life cycle because there is additional overhead in integrating a solution with a Raspberry Pi and that you have a full computer requires more power, requires, yeah. you know, some additional configuration, probably configuring things like networking and stuff like that. Yeah you know, in order to get, in order to get it working. Um, but yep. the more advanced application is probably going to be built on the Raspberry Pi 
um, or uh, you know, with a Raspberry Pi and Arduino in conjunction, um, yeah. because it can act as a host for the Arduino. So, but it's a complicated topic as well because the Raspberry Pi is also a PC. It's also a small PC, and it's really, you know, I think it's often people might think of this as like an embedded board because it looks like a board, but it's really a small computer. And um, you know, one of the other use cases of the Wolfram language on Raspberry Pi is just using it as a very low end desktop for you know purpose of education yeah. or just exploration. Yeah, I mean the other thing about the Raspberry Pi is it's only I think thirty five dollars now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean you can buy a Raspberry Pi for thirty five dollars and it has you know you find your own keyboard and mouse and monitor and you have a fully working computer that you can use. So, so that's why it's really important, or really widely used in education, because it's so easy to access, or e easy to get resources um, to interface with this. Instead of having to spend like, you know, five or $600 on like a Dell computer and monitor and stuff, you just get the monitor, or you could even use like a normal TV, because it has HDMI, and then get your Raspberry Pi for $35, and bam, you got a computer. So, all right. Um, so, okay, that's the actual, that's the last slide that we had. Um, do you want to you show your force sensor? Uh, sure, okay. So, so one, let's do a little bit of show and tell. Yeah, so uh, one application, let me. So right now with the Arduino functionality that we have, um, the, the current board that we support is the Arduino Uno. So there's all these different Arduino boards. There's like one with Bluetooth, there's one with Wi-Fi, uh, one with like just this, but the standard Arduino board is just an Arduino Uno, um, and it doesn't have any of this more complicated stuff. You just plug it in, and you can start using it. Um, the Arduino Uno, however, and that's actually what I've been showing here, has like an additional coprocessor on it that has uh, Wi-Fi capabilities, and so you can interact with it over um, Wi-Fi. So let me yeah, essentially, quick. it's a device that runs Linux, so it has a full operating system on it, and can be interacted with as a as a computer, but it's very important to note it is in a class between the microcontroller and the Raspberry Pi. This thing cannot and will never run the Wolfram language, but when we interact with it, we interact with it as a bare Linux device. Yep, um, and so, so the application I'm about to show, I, I just got out my phone to turn on uh, tethering, so I have a Wi-Fi password, because some of the other Wi-Fi in here is a little unreliable, but so I have Wi-Fi for my phone, and now I'm going to um, connect the laptop to Wi-Fi. But first, before I do that, um, I'm going to first set up the, the UN. So I just plug it in here, and now I can use device open and the device framework uh, to, to open a connection to this device. Um, well, here, let me reopen it here. So we open up that connection. Now there's been a connection to the Arduino UN. And um, whoops. Uh, hang on a second. Um, so, why is that? Oh, here we go. Okay, there we go. So now it's uploading to the Arduino UN, and it's going to program that with a sketch that will basically, via Wi Fi, talk back to the laptop. Um, and all right, there we go. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to physically disconnect it from um, my normal computer over here, and I'll plug it into an external battery I have. Um, so there's nothing else connected here. Uh, it takes about 60 seconds for it to start up, so I just have a little timer here. Just run, wait for it to start back up. Um, in the meantime, one of the things that I want to kind of talk about right now is the device framework. How many people have heard the device framework or know what it is? Um, our node. All right. Great. Um, OK, so device framework is a new feature in Mathematica 10 um, that's kind of a, a way for you to interface with, or way for you to write your own kind of drivers. Um, and there's ones that are included in language as well um, to interface with devices, basically. So it's kind of an object-oriented uh, kind of thing. You have device objects, and you have device classes. Um, if we go back up here to device open, you see that that returned a device object. Um, and there are various things that you can like query about the device objects. They have properties and such. Um, and it's sort of a sim symbolic reference, symbolic reference yeah. to a device. Exactly, exactly. Um, let's make sure I'm on the same Wi-Fi network. I am not. I need to get on the other Wi-Fi network. Okay, cool. All right, so um, we'll wait a few more seconds for this to finish. That's um, an 80-second timer. 
That it is. is. A, that is a pre-coffee 60 second timer right there. Yes, I gave, gave myself a little bit of extra time because, yeah, but. Okay. Um, okay, I think, and the, the other thing I just want to quick show is so I have this, uh, this camera here. I'll turn it on in just a second, but this is another device that you can read from in the Wolfram language. You can just use device read. Actually, you can do find a device as another. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so people can read this. Can run find devices camera. Uh, so there's two. There's the the webcam on this laptop, and then there's also this. Um, yeah, I'm okay. I'll, I'll plug it in a second. If you want to find that, so we can open that device, the camera device, by just using device open of the device object, um, and then we can read from that. So we can do device read from open. It wasn't a very exciting image, but what it basically. So. It's basically, you know, reading from the camera. There you go. Yep. So if we want to make this a live feed, we can just say dynamic at device read camera. As soon as it decides to load that, so you can see. Okay, maybe. Maybe that was. Maybe that was that a was little too ambitious. A little ambitious there. Okay. Well, should just, we get our camera? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, let me just delete this, and I'll. Sure, sure, sure. So, with the camera, I believe I the believe the dy dynamic. dynamic knows that when you use it with a device framework thing, it knows that it should update that. Yeah, it's it's a special case for yeah. dynamic. So, so actually, one thing that that I kind of mentioned at uh, my Arduino talk this morning is that interface dynamic how a uh, kind of internal implementation of that is that it uses like a, a special front end evaluator and so it can kind of like jump in behind the actual kernel that's running um, and that isn't exactly the best because the kernel like knows how to interface with the IO device and knows you know to knows how to handle it and not send it like a million requests in half a second. It, it, it dynamic, there's special things that, di that dynamic has that make it work that way, but. Yeah, I believe specifically the dynamic of a camera is a special case. It yes. is an explicitly special case. I think that is okay. set up to work that way. Okay, so let me, um, yeah, question. Sure, go ahead. I don't, I thought we had one. We had one with the device. It disappeared. Also, either of you guys need it, this will be on the table. We should, I, th I think, you know, we have an advanced section after this. We can just crack open some devices, or some of the device drivers in the layout and actually show them to you if you're interested. Yeah. All right, so what I was going to demo with the Arduino Yoon is, so what I can run device read of Arduino, and that will talk via Wi-Fi to that chip. So you can see, you know, the various analog pins are in units of voltage. Um, and down here I have a nice little dynamic of the current value of the analog pin. And so when I plug my vernier shield into the, um, in here. All right, so it stabilizes about 2.5 volts. Um, and the force sensor that I have attached here, um, when I pull on it, it, the voltage goes down, or if I push on it, the voltage goes up. Um, and again, all of this is like completely over, they're completely wirelessly. Like there's all over Wi-Fi network connections. Yeah. Um, String, no, yes, the, the, the strings are the strings are gone now. We are we are fully wireless. Yes. Uh, so I was just going to demo. You know, this is a five pound weight that we're lifting up. So if we were to run, um, can you just run device read of? Um, here, I'll, I'll hold here. the weight. Okay. Why don't you run the code? Okay. Well, you have a mic in your hand, this I guess. Yeah. This is more my skill set here. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to run uh, device read of Arduino, and then I'm going to read A0. So that's at 1.6 volts. So we can convert that um, to a, uh, we can use the units to convert, you can put it down now. Okay. So if we multiply that result uh, by, let's see if I remember the conversion factor. So, the, so this specific device is what's called a ratio metric device, which means that in the middle, that's zero. 
Uh, at the top, that's like half the distance. At the bottom, that's like, you know, the minimum. And this is a uh, plus or minus 50 newtons. So it has a range of 100 newtons over 5 volts. So if we just use uh, control equals and we say 100 newtons, and then that gets interpreted as a unit, hopefully. Yep, there we go. And now we can divide that by another unit of 5 volts. And so you can see how instead of having to type in all these complicated stuff to use units, you can just press control equals and then type in uh, normal English language. So, um, so that's the conversion between newtons to 5 volts, but then it's ratiometric, so it starts at 2.5 volts. So we have to add 2.5 volts to that first to get that conversion. So let's add, or actually I'll subtract, right? All right, and so if we multiply everything by that, um, did you, did you use the checkbox or something? Oh, you don't need to use the checkbox. It's fine. Um, so that's negative. So let me just multiply that by w negative one. So, so that's how much that weighs in newtons. And if we wanted to like confirm that, we could convert it to pounds force. So we take uh, unit convert of. Let's just do that again. And. We do pounds force, for that. Um, I might have gotten the conversion ratio slightly off. I don't think it's exactly um, 5 volts. But it's supposed to be a 5 pound weight. It's like 3.74 pounds. So there's some error in my conversion factor here. Um, but that's but close enough for off the cuff. It's <laughs> close enough, exactly. Close enough for off the cuff science. Um, so, but, but yeah, what we just wanted to show is that you can interface with um, the device, or this is a new feature that will be coming into probably Mathematica 11, uh, the support for the Arduino UN and wireless Arduino stuff. And you know, while we're not totally accurate here, um, just imagine doing this in C. It's a little bit more of a pain. And so, you know, that's, that's part yeah. of what the, 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 and, you, the uh, quantity units bring to it. And, and imagine doing that in right, C, question. the dynamic. Uh, so, so the setup, so when I initially ran the setup uh, up here, uh, where did I run it? Uh, the device configure of deploy, um, that deploys the sketch, that was when I had it physically plugged into the computer, right? And so when you run that sketch, what it does is it uh, deploys a sketch to figure out um, like the Wi-Fi configuration info, and then that gets saved inside the device driver, and then that's how the device driver knows what IP address to talk to, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, you manually set the the network information, correct? Yeah, I mean, I set so, up yeah. the Arduino UN previously. What we want to eventually do is we want to have options to device open so that you can just buy the Arduino UN, take it out of the package, plug it in, and then you put in your network options into device open, and then it would set all that up. That takes a little bit longer, and so I just manually set that up beforehand, and then this just gets the IP address dynamically. Right. So it's, I mean, we're not... We haven't released yet. It may yeah. very well do that when you release it. Exactly, yeah. Um, and then these are just some histograms that I made of the reading times. And so you can see this is uh, pretty good for, for network communication. Uh, these are in units of seconds. So, a so when I did this for 100 readings, a majority of them were less than 0.1 seconds to get the response time back. So. so yeah, and digital writing was even more. So actually, I could quick show. Um, Open up presenter. Is this, is this still a feed? Did you oh, there we go. Okay. Do you want to point it at something? Oh, uh, yeah, if you could point it at the. This guy right here? Yeah. So, so not just can you do dynamic reading, you can also do uh, writing. Let me. Here's an example. This is not. Should, should we put a, the IPVO over it? Yeah, I can do that quick. Sure, we'll try to make this visible to you guys. So, this is a relatively advanced example of using a Raspberry Pi and Arduino to to do uh, to work with to work on a uh, particular solution. This was a a robot that's essentially designed to uh, draw popular curves. Um, so, it's basically uh, Gar Gary. Could you give a brief explanation of the robot? So the robot has a couple different parts. So we start with a notebook, um, just Wolfram notebook on the computer that communicates with um, Wolfram on the Raspberry Pi. 
Um, so using the notebook on the computer, we can launch essentially a Wolfram kernel instance on the Raspberry Pi, which then can run different functions as a remote kernel on the Raspberry Pi. Um, from there, we'll use the Raspberry Pi to use some similar um, functions that he did and device configure the Arduino um, with the path that we want in order to draw the character that we have. So I have a couple of characters here that I drew earlier. In a moment, hopefully I can get this working. There, there's a video feed, so you can yeah, just you put could, it Yeah, you just down. hold it okay. under. Oh, great, thank you. <laughs> okay. So, so, yeah, so basically what the Wolfram kernel is doing on the Raspberry Pi is it's generating a custom program that includes the instructions required to do this drawing. Basically, a set of movements for the wheels, you know, that will, it, there's a pen attached to it that will basically draw the picture. Okay. So, so there's, there's a, a few different systems at, at play here in this uh, demo. We have number one, the Raspberry Pi running the Wolfram language kernel, and then we have his desktop laptop over there also running Wolfram language and those two are connected via a thing called Launch Manager um, which is a new thing that will be coming it's, out. It's another upcoming another upcoming yes. feature. Do you want to talk about Launch Manager? Sure, a little just bit? briefly. Um, so basically the functionality we're going to be providing especially for remote devices like that is if anyone's ever used Bonjo or printer support you know the basically the, the technology that you know Macintosh is used to find an Apple TV and something like that. It's called, you know, ZeroCon for MDNS. Um, we've set up a, an agent that can run on, a, you know, that can run on a device and basically advertise the kernels available on that device. So if you're on the same local area network, uh, you can just discover any other available kernels on that. And um, it, make, it really simplifies the process of connecting to a remote device. It's as easy as just find it and then open it up, and you have a remote connection to, to that device. I believe um, if anyone was at a Roman Mater's talk, I think, I think probably it's, it's actually happening right now. Okay, so you're missing Roman Mater's talk <laughs> uh, about, about that exact technology, but it, it, that will be coming in a future release. Yep, so, so we have the two kernels. Does somebody have a question? Oh, okay. okay. Uh, so we have the two kernels running. We have one on the Raspberry Pi, one on Desktop Mathematica uh, that are talking via, uh, via the network configuration. And then we also have uh, the Arduino on board. Um, try and show up. Well, maybe not. Um, you know what an Arduino looks like by now. But the, the Arduino is hooked up to the Raspberry Pi, and the Raspberry Pi is talking to the Arduino using the Arduino device driver. Um, and the Arduino is then itself hooked up to all of the motors and physical stuff um, that actually you know, makes the robot move and do stuff like draw. Um, so that kind of just showcases all of the different systems that we have um, available that you can use. Uh, we did not include data drop because when we built this, we were planning to not, um, not have internet connectivity at the location we were first demoing it at, at Maker Faire. Um, so we did not include, but it would have been very easy to add data bin, you know, we could uh, use data drop to upload to a data bin, you know, which which direction it was facing, or you could have added some sort of sensor on it. Right, the robot could have just been Instagramming everything it did. Yeah, exactly. Very, very easily if it had a reliable internet connection. Yes. But we, yeah. were, we were doing it at a con at a event, and it tends to be yeah. internet connectivity is questionable at events. 